Welcome, everyone. My name is Victor Davila. On behalf of um, the AIJ DEC Steering Committee, I welcome you to today's event. Um, like Alberto mentioned, this uh, session will be recorded, but we respect your privacy, so if you prefer to interact by without unmuting or chatting, uh, please DM Alberto or any of the DEC Steering Committee, and we will interact on your behalf um, the best we can. Uh, AIGA is a professional association for design. Um, we are a network of creators. So the nice thing about the, one of the great things about our organization is that you can find yourself in many of these cities that we have around the country and you, and you immediately find yourself within your own people, within a community of creatives that thrives. And uh, uh, our mission is to enhance the abilities of the design educators and educational institutions uh, to prepare future uh, designers for excellence in design practice, design theory, and design writing at the undergraduate and graduate levels while supporting the fundamental mission of AIGA. Uh, we were established in 2004, and we are, our mission is to, unique, uh, to support the unique, unique activities and responsibilities of design educators at the undergraduate and postgraduate levels. Um, our belief in AIGA in general is that together we can do amazing things, and that's why we try to do these events uh, to build community and try to build a, a conversation about uh, things like what we're talking about today. Uh, some Zoom tips reminders. By default, please stay muted to minimize distractions. Be mindful of what shows up behind you. And if you want to share a question in the chat window, raise your, wind, raise your hand or just unmute yourself or just uh, use a chat. Um, if you want to check out any of our past events, please uh, screenshot this URL. We have a lot of great programming that we'd like to share, and um, it's all available there. And uh, if you want to connect with us in our social media, uh, please do so at these addresses. And remember that the conversation continues tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern, 8 a.m. Uh, Pacific time. If you want to continue the conversation or if you want to just start fresh from what we're doing. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Helen Armstrong, who is going to start us off. Helen. Hi, everybody. I'm I really happy to be here. I love this. You know, I I would not have made it as a teacher without a as an educator without the DC. So I always love to come to these things. Um, OK, so I am a professor here at NC State University in my office tonight of, of our uh, Master of Graphic and Experience Design program. And design and AI is my area of research. I'm very interested in it and its implications on society. Very excited to hear this conversation tonight and be a part of it. We met, a, say, a few months ago and started talking about this, uh, the idea for this. And at the time, we were really thinking about how do you cite work that has been produced by AI? How do you acknowledge it in the classroom? And that's still relevant. But since then, things have changed a little, right? Since we had our first meeting, these tools have started to disappear into our other creative tools. So Figma has chat GPT plugins now and other AI plugins. Adobe is supposed to roll out a big generative AI capability thing this summer. And of course, chat GPT is now a part of search in, inside of Bing. So we're seeing these tools kind of disappearing. So now it's even a question of whether our students will even know they're using them because they will be a part of their tools. So we're certainly seeing them in the classroom here. We're even hearing more about them being integrated into industry right now. So it's, you know, it's happening now. These tools are becoming a part of creative flows in firms and companies. So they'll definitely be in our classrooms in the fall if they aren't there now. And as we all know, classrooms are such a great place to really talk about these things in a thoughtful way that is not going to happen in the workplace. So with that, maybe we could just get the discussion started. I'm, I mean, you know, I'm very interested in what you're excited about, about these tools. Like, what are you thinking about, like, right now? What kind of possibilities do you see? How is it affecting your classrooms now? Um, just raise your hand if you want to talk, and we can... We can get it going. Mark, you want to start us? Sure. I'm actually really excited to have this conversation. Thank you for organizing it. Um, I'm actually at Parsons. We're teaching a I'm co-teaching a class with a colleague called 
exploring AI through art and design. So we've actually developed a class that's taking this head on. And what's kind of amazing about it is that when we, when my partner John Key and I started talking about the class, uh, ChatGPT didn't even exist. So it's almost like we find that we're we're kind of inventing our class week by week on the fly because these tools are proliferating so quickly. Um, and you know, one of the I think one of the things that the things that we're really trying to do is like use the classroom as a way to interrogate the tools and to really understand how they work and what their implications are to us as creatives out in the professional world. And what does it mean to create? You know, where does the value of creation now lie? Um, I don't really have a question, I'm just riffing, but you know, one of the things that I'm most concerned about is I've noticed that these AI tools, despite us pushing the students to really use them in a rigorous way, they kind of get super lazy and in a way are it, it seems like it sort of taps their curiosity as opposed to engaging them to be curious. So I'll just put it right there, but that's just some early thoughts that I have. Yeah. Other people have a anybody have a response to that? Are you seeing what are you seeing in your classroom in this interrogation process that I think we are all a part of right now. We thank had you. a, uh, thank you. We had a um, a speaker come speak to the students last Saturday. He brought up AI as, and he, he was kind of like telling the students that it's something that we eventually will have to embrace in the same way that um, in 2009, 2010, there was a lot of web developers that were designing websites, but suddenly Squarespace came along and sites like that, that would kind of like make that a little bit easier to the masses. Um, and he was kind of trying to tell the students that AI isn't something that we should fear, but then we can utilize in a different way, whether it's ideation or whatever. Um, my concern is always um, the copyright aspect of AI, of using AI imagery. And if we could figure out a way past that, then maybe it could be a useful tool, but um, it seems like there are plenty of people right now that are preaching that we have to get used to it because there's no way in the same way that the TV, that the radio people had to get used to the TV. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, there it, there's a lot of interesting court cases going on right now around copyright in the moment. And of course, we have our own laws that are very different from um this kind of global conception of copyright as well that's really impacting that too anyone have a comment um tagging on to victor i you know i i um i have to say i'm 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 like super interested in uploading using AI, like uploading our own data our own images our own personal you know creations or or sketches or whatever we're making into these systems and then riffing off our own work. I think there's, I, I'm like super excited about that idea and the idea of combining some of my work with other people, like asking the system to combine what I'm doing with someone else and then generating new possibilities from two, three, four people. That, that to me is a really kind of rich space right now. It sort of feels like the early days of the internet to me, like everything's possible and can be good or evil. And, you know, it, it's it's a moment. It's a moment to live for sure. I'll add to that. This is uh, this is Justin from California College of the Arts. And I uh, chair and teach the, the uh, MBA in design strategy program. And I'm teaching a class right now on AI and ethics. And what we're talking about is using, sorry, I'm outside, so if there's a little noise, um, using um, AI, not to generate you know, the, the results or the output, but to use it as a way to generate the first option really, really quickly. We have one student who's an architecture. Uh, well, actually he is an architect, so he's, he's from his current life and he's trying to do something else right now. But you know, they're using it um, also for, uh, furniture design inside of the buildings that they're designing, which is, you know, he brought a he brought a uh, example of a client who said, 
hey, here's, you know, we're working on this building, blah, blah, blah. We'd also love for some of the chairs to, you know, and some of the furniture in the building to echo what we're go where we're going with this building. And I think the example is butterflies or something like that. And so they used Mid Journey to type in, you know, chairs that take on the, you know, characteristic of butterflies. And it gave them the first examples. They didn't use those to, you know, with the client, they use those as first examples to then design something for the client. So, you know, yes, copyright is perhaps still an issue, but, you know, there are plenty of times when this will generate really interesting first options or ideas, use it as your ideation partner, options and ideas that you can then go and design with, a, you know, with human touch, with the human element, the things that you, you know, that your client is talking about or, you know, whoever it may be. So. We're, we're talking a lot about that, not not fearing it, but actually utilizing it the same way that people have become adept at, at Squarespace, it's even designers, right? Uh, utilize it there so it gives you a really quick start and makes you maybe, maybe even more efficient and perhaps even gives you a partner in the whole thing. Yeah, that's a super interesting space, that first, you know, first stab audiation space. Danielle, did you have a comment? I think it's Danielle, do you have your hand up? Yeah, so I just kind of, I, I love the idea of comparing it to Squarespace and um, also kind of Canva with Adobe right now, right? There's a little bit of that going on as well. And I've been lately thinking about how can you bring it into the classroom to add to the student's work. And I was thinking about possibly having for next semester, this semester, I, I don't think I can integrate it into my lesson plans right now, but having them using AI to kind of brainstorm and look at competition and using that as kind of a, a starting point of doing research in terms of whatever the, the client project that they're working on. Um, I guess where I'm kind of struggling with is what do you allow? What do you not allow? You know, I, I feel like it's, I think it's great if it's a starting point and it's a research, but and we're not necessarily there yet, but with uh, Dolly, where they're creating artwork from what you ask it to do, at what point do we decide, like, is that allowed for the students to add to their project or is that something that we completely not allow? And like, where is that line? And I'm not really sure what the answer is, but just kind of curious what everyone else thinks. Yeah, it's a great question. I'm curious what other people think too. Patricia, do you have a, is that related to what you, are interested in talking about it it is and i i kind of echo everyone and you helen because i'm really interested in, to see what happens and i think about what happened in the 90s when all of a sudden designers had access to typography they could set type they didn't have to depend on a typesetter and people without a lot of graphic design training all of a sudden were creating magazines and it ended up being a very different very, very different look than what was happening. Um, and it was because because we could, the technology was there. So I'm thinking, you know, I kind of, in the same time, I wanna take what I have and put it in there and see what it does. And I think it's gonna, it could take us in some very different stylistic directions and open up a lot of conversation. Um, and I'm sure there will be people that think it's good and not good, just like what happened in the nineties but it's here, it's, it's changing. And my only other point is that there are a lot of students that are like doing type design and they're doing generative studies with it. What this will allow is people who are not adept maybe at doing, at writing code like that to do this same type of thing. Yeah, that, that opening up, it seems so powerful right now. There's, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, to me, that's, that's, the changing who is designing and what are they designing and how are we exchanging those ideas through these new tools? I'm gonna I'm gonna um, ask a question. I mean, I'm gonna read one of the questions from the chat because I think that connects to a lot of what we're talking about, which is um, this is coming from a UX designer, HCI grad student at DePaul University. That's always fun to see a grad student here. So I just want to give a special call out to that. Um, so they're asking, I get uh, I get asked by a lot of undergrads about how they should be prepared for AI's effect on the job market and how should I address this issue with them? 
how should undergrads be, how do, what does it look like on the job market? And I'm going to, I'm going to start that off with what they don't know. The job market doesn't know either. They're trying to figure out. And that's one of the things I think is really interesting right now. They're figuring out while we're, we're all figuring it out at the same time. I don't think anybody's way ahead on this. Louise, do you have a comment? Um, Go, Alberto. Alberto, what do you want to say? Yeah. I, I, especially on this topic, um, they may not be ahead, but the job market is certainly using it. And my point to everybody who's hesitant right now about getting this into the classroom, the job market is using it. And I've seen it advertising agencies, I've seen it in studios, and I've seen it in in-house departments all within the last four or five months. Uh, both on the chat GTP level uh, using text generation, but also on the image level. And a lot of the reasoning that they're using is, well, they don't have the copyright figured out. So legally we have so much gray area here, we're gonna use it anyway. And I think that part of the reason of this session, right? About the ethics of using this is going to be to get students with their hands dirty, but also understanding what's happening because they are gonna face tough decisions by the fall especially those seniors, because I bet you they're going to go into these uh, uh, work systems and they're going to have to be using these tools, whether they think it's right or not. And I think it's better to have them really think about it and bring the right conversations into the job market. I think it's going to be much more effective than letting the job market decide if this is right or not. Yeah, that's awesome to be thinking about, you know, us kind of leading the way and defining this space a bit, and then in that way, having kind of a ripple effect across industry. Louise, do you want to add on to that? Well, I just, well, <laughs> yeah, the, this conversation about the ethics, which is the subject of this is, is, a, is a big and fraught one. You know, on the other hand, uh, you know, we live in an age of appropriation. And so, um, <laughs> you know, where I'm not advocating theft of other people's intellectual property and work that's the that's the complex conversation i think or the complexity of the conversation but actually what i did want to ask and and you can put this aside for a later conversation if you want is um uh concerning like uh creating original work with your with your own assets and about the difference between you know uh, something like chat GPT or any of the other um, AI engines that are that are essentially using the entire internet as their neural networks versus creating your own neural network. So I'm wondering about um, doing that and whether um, any educators are currently working in that way and how they're using that, you know. So, yeah, so it's hard to do that with uh, transformer models, the text to image, but you can do them with GAN systems, so general adversarial networks, and you can use something like Runway and ML or Art Breeder. Those are both just online, you know, software tools you can use to do that. So it's not, you're not putting in a text prompt and you're getting an image, you're putting in a bunch of images and then it's generating and you're training a model on your images to generate new images based on your images. So you can do that. And I know um, Anastasia Reina is a, a professor at RISD that's done a lot of work with that in the classroom. And the, I mean, I think the, the work that her students have done has just been phenomenal in that space. So that, so there, yes, that is possible. It is doable, not text to image, um, so that's the uh, transformer model, but just pure generative GAN systems. Yes, you can do that in the classroom. Can I offer a comment? Yes, yes, I'll offer a comment. So I've been on there for six months now on Mid Journey, and I brought it to the classroom. They've used it every single class. We've created mood boards, we've created mock ups for food trucks, we've created cartoon characters. I just put a link in the server there to a presentation I'm doing in PowerPoint uh, that has the four, I think, most important videos to watch about uh, ethics and, and those kinds of issues. Um, I was an early adopter. I worked at the Miami Herald as a photojournalist, and then I designed the Macintosh Plus, the entire layout of the page, and I watched 300 paste-up people lose their jobs. 
Um, the Miami Herald now has three photographers. It had 64 uh, back in the day when I worked where, and no office whatsoever. So these are all disruptive things that are going to change how we do things. But just like Photoshop's advent and stock photography and all the other changes that we've seen, in the 22 years of me teaching graphic design, I've gone from 90% of my students being going to the publishing industry to literally zero going to the publishing industry because there's no jobs there for it. So if you don't adapt, evolve, and innovate in this space, I think you're losing as an educator. I think we've been behind the ball when it came to every big change because most of us maybe worked in the profession for a very long time and then went into academia and never went back to the profession and saw what was happening every day. Um, at a community college where I teach, kind of the cool thing about it is we bring in uh, industry experts uh, twice a year to tell us what's happening and what's shifting. So I've been able to change all my academic courses. Uh, we now have a UX UI class. We have a social media management class. Uh, those are uh, job profiles that didn't exist before, but they're the highest paying industry job profiles right now. And I do believe very strongly that AI is a part of that whole process. So I started, I'm going to do a podcast every Thursday night at six o'clock um, going forward, talking about, you know, bringing the best people on board to talk about all these issues. Uh, just had a conversation with the woman whose work uh, was a comic book or a kind of a thing, a graphic novel, I guess is a better word. Um, and the copyright service decided not to grant her the copyright on her images because they were created in mid journey and they deemed it not to be artful enough to uh, deem copyrightable. Um, and that's caused a whole big stir, of course. I think that the that's a test case that will be surpassed by another test case that does go into the, the details of what um, active participation and direction um, the artist does have to play in this new space. Um, as a photographer for over 50 years of my life, um, you know, people say, oh, it's just so easy to do it, right? You press the button and you've got instant art. I mean, that's what the comment for painters who had trained 30 years of their lives back in the 1830s uh, when photography came along and upset the apple cart. Uh, this is not going to go away. Uh, it's not going to change. How we use it, though, and how we educate ourselves to use it responsibly, ethically, um, think about how it might affect. I mean, there's tons of stories coming out already about um, there were photographs of the homeless that were generated in mid-journey, and the homeless community actually liked that because instead of some sort of, you know, um, uh, you know, homeless porn that, that was being taken and photographed and people actually being used, this was a generic uh, composite of a person being used in a portrayal to get funding for homeless projects. So there's positive ethical and negative ethical. You know, I think technology like it's always been is sort of neutral. It's what we do with it that makes the difference, whether we're violating someone's copyright because it aggregated every picture that's on the internet together and then it made a composite of what a banana that's purple looks like. Um, so I think copyright issues have, are pretty well taken care of if you think about how it actually works. And I think that's one of the things that a lot of people right now are not getting educated enough about. Um, if you want to go to the link that I put there in the, the meet chat, it's um, there's a uh, PowerPoint presentation there. And I've spent over 650 hours so far in mid journey in six months. Uh, so I'm, I'm getting kind of crazy about it. And I produced over 24,000 images so far. That's so, pretty amazing. Yeah. yeah, I'm doing a children's book that I'm doing based upon my daughter uh, is Im her image about reading a book and then going into a portal and having a dream in a, a fanciful space with a, a black cat that um, it talks to animals. Um, so the examples of the work is in the PowerPoint if anybody wants to uh, take a look at it. I'm doing fashion photography. I'm doing um, mock-ups and that sort of thing and adding a bunch of those kind of things. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you for sharing those with sure. us. And I know that they're collecting all the links, et cetera, uh, so that you know, we can have access to them. So those are all very much appreciated. And I love the point that you made about that, you know, this, it does take time. This isn't a, a you know, press the button and you have this right. amazing, perfect image. It's, it is a, there is a craft to creating these. And 
um, and then doing something with them, right? Other than just looking at them, like how do you get them yeah, to I, a place where you can actually do something? I'm gonna, I'm just gonna jump to yeah. one of the chat, um, the chat comments because I want to make sure I'm including chat comments as well. And this one is from industry, so it's nice to have like this sort of industry educator of voices here. So this is someone from industry chiming in. Uh, about, I'm sure you guys can see the chat too, but just chiming in and asking, or chiming in to make the point that they're at the a mid-side agency and they've had no hesitancy using these tools like chat, GPT, and Dolly. And they're not, they, they're not just handing them off to a client, kind of back to Rick's point and saying, here you go, it's done. They're, but they're using it as inspiration and assets and building on those, building on those initial uh, generations and then doing things with them. There's another, uh, there's another, oh, go ahead. There was a comment before uh, from uh, Ali Place as an administrator uh, where she, you know, as an admin of a department, she's seen a change there that might be uh, important for us to talk about too. Um, you know, the reliance on stock graphics and Pinterest. I mean, the future of stock will be AI because I don't have to spend five weeks looking for the perfect image. I can just tell the system and it will generate it for me. Um, so I think that that is, you know, the issues that Ali's bringing up, uh, you know, about visual plagiarism and all that. It's just going to be so complicated uh, for everybody to certainly process. Uh, but I think that even, and Ali, I would say that Yes, it's hesitance, but I think that we just need to engage the topic and be in the conversation right now, because if we're not, others are going to be making the rules for us. So hence why one of the reasons why we're making these sessions. I I think, I, I yes, and, I, and I'm going to go back to her point a minute about the increasing reliance on these sort of stock image, et cetera, because I, that, and, you know, what is visual plagiarism, et cetera. I do think those are such important discussions for us to be trying to address in the classroom right now. And they're not easy discussions to have at all, but at least to get the students questioning and thinking about where the visuals are coming from and what they're referencing and you know what data set they're using and what does that mean and who does own this and what are they, what what does it mean for them to do something with it, to use it as an ideation tool? What does it mean to you know, uh, upscale it and package it as something else. Um, Sack uh, has had his question up for a little bit, and I, <laughs> I have a glitch. I didn't see the hand up, so. Oh, uh, I didn't see the ahead. hand up either. Go, <laughs> go ahead, Zach. Oh, go, Zach. Totally all right. Uh, <laughs> I, everybody's making such great points, um, so I had no problem waiting. Um, but I, I teach at Cal State LA, and we're a Hispanic-serving institution, minority-serving institution. And it, the, I had this conversation, we brought up AI. Um, I have my seniors do weekly readings of like industry news and bring them to class and just as a way to start class and have conversation. And it, the topic of AI came up and it's truly an interesting minefield for the students to figure out like, I mean, I'm, we're dealing with a lot of imposter syndrome. And so they already don't know like how to adapt to all these changes. Um, it, but one of the things I found really fascinating was in looking at ChatGPT and looking at these, you know, mid-journey and all these creation tools, um, what I find most useful for my students as we move into this new era is their communication skills, their writing skills, really. And I'm trying to teach my students more and more the how powerful language is. Because b before language going into the design brief, going into presentations and whatnot was so useful to like, you know, bridge the gap with clients and with, uh, you know, other creatives. But now we have to use language to bridge the gap with technology and, and AI. And if you can find the right words, you can generate much stronger, better, faster imagery. Um, and so like one of the things I, I I love where um, I think it was Mark said, where does the value of creation lie in our field nowadays, um, kind of at the top of the, the talk. And that's something I think that I'm, I'm talking a lot with my students in regards to AIs, not necessarily like, yeah, to Rick's point, it's just another tool, right? Photoshop, 
democratized you know, the ability to do things, Quark and all of those fun things, democratized publishing software. And so at this point, AI is just another democratization of art. How do you continue to have value? And especially, I love Rick said, you know, students with poor language skills are using it to write design briefs. My students are, struggle with English, right? And, and so we are truly just working on core communication skills and that include visual as well as written. So I think the writing portion for me is like the huge aha moment when it comes to AI is how do we get our students to learn the value of being able to actually say what they need and what they want and what they mean. So something to think about. Yeah, that's such a powerful point about language, you know, and the, I mean, as someone who loves language, I had really, I don't think I'd really appreciate it until you said that, how, how, how we can have those kinds of discussions in the classroom. Well, even the language of being able to be an illustrator. So to be able to to draw is a skill set that's slowly slipping away out of the hands and moving towards the Photoshop ideation process. Using photography in the classroom, I, mean, I was one of the first ones to create a photography class uh, that was in the classroom, was integrated as part of the graphic design curriculum. Um, it it draw, I find that the graphic design students learn photography so much quicker because they have other skills about color and composition and um, ideation, negative space, et cetera. Um, so I see it as an ideation thing that's made me absolutely, you know, spending 20, 30 hours a week doing this because uh, just the iterative ways that I can think about maybe possibly making new income. I reached out to a couple of people that were really interesting, a um, storyboard artist who does movies and games in Jacksonville, and he's doing a complete um, workup what would normally take him to do the storyboards about a month and a half, he did in a week um, with the images that are far more realistic photographically even um, given the stories. And he had to figure out how to work the system. There's still a lot of things to keeping a consistent character profile, um, you know, film to buy. He was using Christopher Nolan style um, to, to kind of prompt his way into it. So there's a there's a huge education um, to get to a point where you can actually create things. But just like photography, I'll go out with my students and I'll make pictures of my phone uh, just walking around downtown and I'll come back with amazing pictures because I've got 50 years that went into that. Right. It's like Paula Cher talking about, you know, the Citibank uh, logo, you know, it's 10 minutes on a piece of paper, but it's the her entire life up to that point that made it. So I think that's what we have to hold on to. The art or design of what we do has to do with our experience and our intentionality and our understanding of how to work intentionality to create objects that are of value to um, the people we work for and we work with. Yeah, I think that relationship between the students and the educators seems really important there. Mark's had his hand up for a bit, so Mark. Yeah, so I mean, this is a slight pivot from what we're talking about, but one of the things that um, that was quickly made very apparent to me in in the playing around with Mid Journey that I did was its inherent bias. I mean, it's sort of shocking, and you know, it's based on this five point eight five billion, you know, image database that Lion created, which is basically inherently biased because it's pulling from you know, uh, basically biased Western culture. So my concerns are like, you know, we're all using this, these tools that are inherently biased and how is that perpetuating stereotypes um, and the things in society that we don't really want to perpetuate. So I don't have an answer to that, but it's just something that really, and we talk, I, we talk a lot about that in our classroom. That's a really important aspect of you know what I'm trying to how I'm getting trying to get my students to kind of understand these these systems. Yeah, that's something we've been talking about a lot too in terms of bias. That if you begin with bias and then keep building on something that has a lot of bias, then you're amplifying that bias. And so the it's a it's a the effect of what you're doing is is can be a bit frightening if you're not paying attention. Um, does it someone else have a comment about? thinking about bias in the systems 
I'll I'll add one more little personal thing that as soon the first time I used Midjourney, the first thing I did was I have a kid with a genetic disorder. So the first thing I did is put that in to see what came out. And what came out was pretty horrifying, actually. So that was like my first experience with it. I was testing it for bias and I was, I was uh it did exactly what I thought. <laughs> really, really horrible portrayal. Um, but do other people because this I think this is starting to get to some of the um, you know the concerns we have too and the the things that we are really trying to dig into in the classroom that are perhaps a little harder to tackle in the industry. So I'm gonna I'm gonna switch then to um, to a question in the chat that's been here a bit because I think this is not exactly, but related, and maybe going back to some of Allie, Allie's concerns too. Um, Sebastian asked if someone had an example of an unethical uses of AI in the classroom or industry, things that have happened in your class that have you felt like, or, or in industry that you felt really uncomfortable with that is definitely crossing an ethical line. I mean, I think, an obvious example of uh, sort of the unethical practices that are happening are, are deep fakes. Um, the fact that AI can be generated now to create the likeness of someone and apply new audio or whatnot to them. And it, I mean, <laughs> every new innovation that comes out with sort of digital media these days, I kind of have to have a conversation with my students about this is why we teach critical thinking. This is why we challenge you to question what you're told, even from us, because I, who, I could be a robot. You know, you, you never really know, like we're getting to that point. So I think that unethical practice is truly, the, thing. the defect scares me the most, to be honest. Yeah, that is terrifying. We could all be robots right now. There's a question here from Philip that's very interesting around um, the question about has anyone found any conversations around how this automation should be reducing our workloads and culture of overworking? If not, do we have a responsibility as educators to attempt to, to attempt to create conversations around this? So I'm I'm going to add on to that a little bit in the in that you know this idea of shifting workload, increasing productivity, you know, how does how how does AI relate to that? And are we having good conversations about the impact of that upon our kind of culture of overworking? I'll offer that I think the move for the the British to move to four day work weeks is something we definitely are interested in. Uh, when you first picked up the ability not to have to press on type, when you first picked up the ability not to have to do layout with a machine language code, uh, when you picked up the ability to pick up a camera and take a picture instantly and use it, um, it changed the shift from professional photographers being hired and you taking the picture of the CEO for the website. I think graphic designers have been adding to our litany of capabilities and skill sets to a point actually that in our two-year degree, we can't get everything in there as to what they're doing social media management didn't exist before so if we look at every major shift in technology we just have to look back at the past and figure out what we really have to be teaching is how do you adapt evolve and um innovate um adapting evolving and innovate is like my my new mantra in the classroom because things are just changing too fast um, as soon as you find out about it, people are doing things and then you all of a sudden there's 10 new jobs. So the jobs that were 20 years ago when I started teaching, they are not the job titles anymore. And those job titles don't make any money. You know, a layout artist. I mean, come on. Um, so. I'm, I'm just going to uh, put some attention on the chat about uh, just going back to this idea of workload reduction and that. Capitalism seems to always find a way. Zachary is making the point. Capitalism always seems to find a way around that. Uh, the actual reduction of our load. 
Um, and then that was an interesting uh, comment in the chat too around bias and um, from Alexander, but aren't biases needed? For example, chat GPT is inherently biased to not be racist. And that's true, we have, we're using bias to fight bias in these systems, which becomes very complex. And uh, I've heard some great discussions from social scientists on this topic and how do you, uh, but around the, this balance between fighting bias, fighting bias, correcting these systems, right? Collect, correcting societal cultural bias within these systems and then um, putting that out into the world. And I, it is a fascinating topic. Ellen, in terms of the bias aspect, I don't know how many of you here have tried ChatGTP in other languages, but you can tell ChatGTP to do something and spill it out in Spanish and Italian. And, and it's interesting because the more you use language, the more you can actually affect the system, right? Because then you can be like, can you give it to me in Mexican Spanish? Can you give it to me in Puerto Rican Spanish? Can you give it to Venezuelan Spanish? And the story changes dramatically just by adding that qualifier uh, that attaches to a cultural uh, uh, entity of somehow. And I think that, you know, when I hear all of this, I think I go back to a Sachs critical thinking comment, right? Is that we need to be teaching students that these systems are gonna behave or respond to however smartly we interact with them. And we need to know the prompt that we put into it. If we, you know, ChatGDP could be uh, white bias, uh, blank bias. I, I, it hasn't been my experience interacting with it. I still think it always kind of leans somehow. But if the students don't understand how to interact with that machinery, they are going to just be blindsided by the bias regardless. And I think that they are in a position to learn that these tools will behave exactly as we feed them. Um, I kind of went in circles there, sorry, but it, it, the, the whole point is that it, just by exploring the tools in other languages, it, it really reveals how the system is still developing and trying to find out. And uh, if, we, if we don't show students how to do this or serve as guides right now, I think that uh, it'll take longer for them to realize the utility of these tools. Yeah, just thinking about guiding them through this process and make and and there's something you said, Alberto, that I think is so uh just I don't know, really powerful about you know, if we're feeding these systems, we're 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 able to critically examine the responses that we get for bias, but we're also learning more about our own biases by interacting with these systems. So it's like it's a you can't. You can't interact with these student these systems and not see bias, right? It's it's in your face, and so using that in a critical way in the classroom seems like a great tool of kind of of acknowledgement and um, you know forcing ourselves to to really interrogate the the language that we're using and the way the systems are working. Annabelle, do you have a question, a comment? Uh, I'm going to follow your mantra of going around and around a little bit. Um, this is super interesting. And I have to confess, I have not explored uh, Dolly or I think it's mid journey, but I'm feeling compelled to do so by spring quarter. I have tried chat GPT and the, the language is quite good. So I can see the value and I can see the value in all the tools in the same way that Maybe it helps the students to generate lots of versions or lots of iterations. And if anybody's going to find a way to save time, I'm guessing the students will do it before us. Um, so I think then the discussion becomes with them, like, why is one of these better or worse than another? For me, next quarter, I'm actually teaching a, a class on graphic design to non-designers. So this is going to be 100 seniors who are ready to get out who've got every other major besides design. And so for them, templates are kind of the way they work. They all have a templated resume. They're pretty happy with the stock photography. And so I end up talking to them about kind of this Ikea method of like, great, you've all got the same looking resume. How can you figure out uh, what makes yours different? And so I have two questions for you and, and those of you that have maybe used it. One is, 
um, if I were to explore an exercise where they all get a, the same set of images, if they all go in and use the same web journey or dolly, will they get the same output? Would they be able to see that or will they get something different? And then my second question is as an educator, you know, I've, I've told the students, okay, great. At least the non-design class, like you have the choice of lots of templates. You have to be discerning about which one works best. So I'm not telling them don't use templates at all. But I don't even know as an educator, how on earth am I supposed to grade anything uh, anymore to know what's real, what's not? Am I just going by a bibliography that they're giving me or sources? Or I, I think this question might have been asked before, but I'm, I, I can see the value in it as an iterative tool. And, you know, when we all teach design students, most of them are are willing to go beyond that. They, they are looking for some level of originality. Whereas I think this group of non-designers is gonna be looking for like, yeah, it looks pretty good. I'm I'm happy there and I'm gonna stop there. And so I don't, that was round and round, but I'm curious about the output. If a group of students, cause you've been talking about bias, how does it work if I give them all the same images or the same set of words? And then how does anybody handle the grading of this? So, sorry, that was long-winded. So they're all going to get something different. So the images are are generated, completely generated every time. So even if they all put in the same prompt, they're going to get different responses. And even if they all put the same prompt into Midjourney, they're going to get something different, each one of them. Or range and do you do you feel the, I mean, I can see the value in that, that you can see how many different ways you might be able to interpret the same thing. That's what we say when we want our students to generate 100 ideas for X. Yeah. But where where do you go with that? What, what do I what do we do with well, that? So it's it's really for me a tool of ideation and iteration. It's um, literally you can design a logo. So I, I can say I want a sports logo for the Miami Dolphins. It'll give me 50 versions. Where I used to do that, all of that kind of as you know, sketches that a student would do, they do 30 sketches for, you know, for their idea, and then they would it come through and be selective. I think um, AI and Mid Journey in specifically is just like photography. It's more about the editing after the fact. It's the culling that is the quality of, of um, professionalism that you need to figure out why this is better than that choice. Um, and when you have ultimately hundreds of choices to, to make from, your end result can be very iterative and you can even add chaos where you say, give me something really different than what I had before which you can help them think it through. So instead of giving them, um, you know, you can give them an assignment, you can say iterate until you get to a point. And then your job really is about making selections. Just like yeah. I'll take 10,000 photographs, but I'll end up with the one that ends on the cover of a magazine. Yeah, I'm going to, um, what is, I, to me, Annabelle, that, that goes back to what's the purpose of the assignment and what are they trying, you know, are you trying to teach sure. them to see? Are you trying to teach them to, respond to some kind of design problem or how how are they using these what's the context yeah i mean certainly for this non-design group i'm trying to teach them the language that designers use so that they can understand kind of why form matters for communication so i'm never i'm i'm upfront about the fact that they're not there to be designers they're there to just learn the language um i mean back to your kind of point rick can you go back into Web Journey? Like it's generated 15 images for the Miami lo 50 logos. Can you say choose the best three? It can't do that for you, right? No, you do it. So every time you prompt something, it gives you four images. You pick then which ones you want to upscale. And then you okay. can re-roll it again, and it will basically do it again and keep doing it until as many times as you want. So to get an image I really like at the end, I'll do 130 re-rolls. And I'll end it with one picture. And I've got a two megabyte file. So this is small. And now the new version of Midjourney is coming out next month. Um, and it's supposed to be in the four or five megapixel range. Um, the one thing it doesn't do well is text. If you write a word, it cannot make it. But you can do letter forms that are quite spectacular. Um, you know, a uh, letter E out of porcelain and gold filigree. Uh, and it will make that for you. So you can ideate things that you couldn't possibly create in real life. I, I think the issue there is that, uh, Rick, yes, you can make them 
but students are going to be facing end final results from the moment one. What I think that this, the system lacks is an opportunity for students to face a crude landscape at the beginning where they need to figure it out. I think one of the harms that this does is that from the get-go, they see a finalized product. Um, and I think that part of the creative process to teach them how to think, and I'm not saying that this is bad, or I, I just want to put that out there, right, is I want to sometimes see students struggle with form. I want to see them try to figure out why it looks a particular way. Why can't, how can they make it look better with these tools? It always looks perfect. I mean, I can tell it, oh, give me a sketch, but that sketch is probably going to look better than what I can draw myself. So if, if it always looks perfect, how do we teach progress? And that's just a thought, not necessarily a, a, a citing point in the conversation. Well, for me, that goes back to context too. What what are they? What is the design context that they're responding to? What what's the prompt? What are they? What are they producing that what comes out of Mid Journey would be the end result? You know, that's that. But I I hear what you're saying, Alberta, about the it is very polished and finished looking. It doesn't. It doesn't actually encourage you to see it as this sort of rough start. It encourages you to see it in this like, oh, it's so perfect, which is, is kind of interesting to think about. Yeah, I Mark mean, Rick's, has, oh, go ahead. Rick's point about the beautiful letter forms, that's actually one of the first things that I got mid-journey to do, like apply textures and shading and lighting. But everything was beautiful. Even the ones that I didn't like, I, I can't say that they were not final products. And that's a hard thing to process because if it looks so done, it minimizes my search for try to make it better. But that's just me and how I operate, right? I need to see it crude to kind of try to find different ways to kind of grow it. So anyway, sorry, Mark, I know you had your hand up and I totally jumped on you. Oh, no, that's okay. I mean, one of the things I'm trying to do with the class that I am that I have, which is a really, which is interesting because it's a totally, um, interdisciplinary group of students is like I keep every assignment. I'm like, this is just not about prompt generation. It's the 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 prompt and what you generate is not the end result. It's like, what's the idea? How are you using this software in service of your idea? And so, you know, it's the thing about Mid Journey is like it's so darn sexy because you can just put in all these crazy prompts, and it is astonishing what you get. But that's just because it's like we're eating the candy now. You know, it's just like it's so dazzling. But then ultimately, that's not an idea, just dumping all these prompts in. So that's the thing. Like, I actually don't want the students just to sort of use it as a way to explore initial ideas. It's like, how do they weave this software or these, this, these programs into the overall concept? Um, I kind of often use this like example. I don't know if anybody saw the New York Times did this funny like chat GPT Valentine where you it was just this kind of fun interactive thing in the New York Times on their website um, using chat GPT. And I always want to say, well, there's a concept. It's like the chat GPT is in service of the idea of how these how the New York Times, you know, came up with this fun interactive thing for Valentine's Day. So that's what I'm trying to work with with my students. Annabelle had a great quote in here that goes back to what Alberto was saying, and I think also connects to this idea of how do we put this into the process, which was is a Bill Buxton quote that the fidelity of the sketch should match the fidelity of the idea. AI makes everything look finished, even if the idea isn't. Perhaps connecting both of your thoughts there on that. Any other, anybody work, any other thoughts on integrating into the design process and how you're doing that other than, you know, kind of ideation and early on? When it comes to ideation, for me, um, the the trick is again can you articulate what you're trying to do and i think for the students who don't have the skills in the visualization and they're building that i often find in this conversation that uh ai becomes too much of a crutch 
and that they rely too much on the ability of a of an external tool to do the things for them. Um, I've had the same problems with Procreate and Photoshop. You know, the students rush to software to do an idea, and they miss the what um, you know Alberto was talking about that the experimentation and trial and error that leads to understanding the form, understanding the sort of way that it is made. Um, yeah, so like that's that the idea pro idea process for me is like, can you articulate your thought? And if the AI can generate the goal of like what it could potentially be, then you can deconstruct that. This is what I teach my students when we look at Pinterest. Like, how do you take what's there, deconstruct it to understand what the mechanics of what happened, right? Can you actually, you know, simplify it down to ways that you could recreate? And that way you build the tools just like you would practicing the masters in, in impressionism or realism. Um, you get the schools, you build up those muscles. So if you use it as a training tool to say, hey, here's what is possible. Now, how do we make it, right? Reverse engineer. Then I think that could be really useful for students. Yeah, that's a really interesting approach. Um, so yeah, we're at the we're at the hour mark, as Alberto is pointing out. We didn't really talk about whether or not we thought some kind of statement for students was possible. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to stick around and talk about that. Yeah, the, the if, that is, even, if that even if anyone even has interest at that at that point, I do think that the conversation has kind of moved on already. Annabelle, I also want to just uh, amplify Annabelle's comment about adding AI projects to the design teaching resource. That way, we are really supporting each other around this discussion. I'm more than happy to to share the resources I've been putting together. I have a, a whole folder that I've shared the link there uh, for um, that includes students doing um, creating cartoon characters, um, making mock-ups for uh, water bottles, t-shirts, and everything else, um, and doing illustrations and illustration class. Uh, we had did an editorial illustration about um, a student uh, about a AI bot winning an art competition. So she designed a, uh, a robot that had a paintbrush and everything and totally ideated through the process, but then took the final result and then embellished it to make it something really on point by adding a first place ribbon on the front of this cute little robot and all these kind of ideas. Um, you know, so in, in every single class, someone's coming up with a new way to use it. Website design and layout, uh, we did that as well, did mock-ups of a website design. I did a food truck, um, so I didn't have to buy a food truck that I wanted a certain specific way for the food truck to look. Um, and then, so, you know, um, I, I'm offering those for anybody that can use them. And my whole point is that I'm continuing to be, I want to be like the place that people can go. In fact, I'm opening up this mid-journey um, OneDrive folder that you can actually store stuff on there if you'd like. And as I generate new uh, information, we can use it as a Dropbox for sharing ideas. And I'd be more than happy to curate those. So it's great you're sharing resources. And that's, thank you, Rick. Sure. So we, we are at the 601 mark. Maybe we should draw this conversation to a close so that we can then resume tomorrow. We have another uh, another discussion tomorrow morning. Yeah, for all of you here, uh, tomorrow at 11 uh, a.m. Uh, Eastern Time, we're going to repeat, in a way, the session. It will be moderated by Alan, uh, not by Helen, and the idea is to kind of focus on other areas of the same topic of the conversation. Uh, both of these sessions will be uploaded to YouTube so that we can review them, and all of the links and resources will be shared with the community uh, by next week. Uh, but certainly, thank you, all of you that are here. If you want to stick around, I'm going to stick around for 10 more minutes. If anybody wants to stick around for a particular topic that you maybe did not want to talk on the computer, I'm going to stop the recording, and then we can chat uh, for a few more minutes. <laughs>